Uh, welcome back to everyone, uh, and uh, especially uh, welcome to um, our second session, which is dedicated to uh, the data producer uh, that is uh, the Office for National uh, Statistics uh, talk and updates about, uh, on the one hand, uh, the existing uh, labor force and annual population survey. So that will be our first uh, presentation by uh, Martina Helm uh, in just a moment. And then, uh, yes, indeed, an update on uh, the preparations for the uh, transformed uh, labor force survey uh, by James Harris. So uh, in terms of how we are planning to organize this session, so I, I think Martina and James uh, will be talking between uh, 15 and 20 minutes each. We will have a space for questions immediately after the presentation. And then if there are additional questions, uh, we will, uh, or, or discussion, we will have them uh, after the, uh, both uh, presentations uh, have individual presentation have uh, and so uh now to uh introduce uh the the first presentation uh i think it's uh, obvious, obvious to most of us that even if we are moving to a transformed labor force survey there there is still going to be a labor force survey for at least a few months and there will be many users of the labor force survey for uh, the foreseeable uh, future. So uh, it's really necessary and useful to have a, an update on the uh, latest development for the, by the team working on this. And uh, this will be given by Martina. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your surname when Helm, uh, who works at uh, the Social Survey Directorate uh, of uh, the Office for National Statistics, and she's the survey manager for the LFS and uh, APS. So, Martina, the floor is, you, is yours. Sorry. Thank you very much, Pierre, and uh, also welcome from me uh, to this conference today. It's really great to see it so well attended. It's obviously still a, a big interest in this data and, and widely used um, across users, which is fantastic to see. So, I'm hoping I'll you know, cover some interesting information for you in this uh, presentation today, which is meant to give you a bit of an update of, um, I guess, what happened on the LFS APS since the last time we, we presented at this conference. So before I start, can I just check that you can see my screen? Yes, we can see, or at least I can, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. So what I was uh, planning to cover uh, was giving a bit of an update of what happened uh, in the data collection space since we last spoke to you, um, what has been happening on the reweighting and, and the discussions we're having in that space. Um, I wanted to uh, bring up um, an issue we identified on the, on the SOC coding and also wanted to talk a little bit about the transition to the transformed LFS, although I'm not going to go into that much detail on that because obviously James is going to cover more on that in uh, his slot in a bit. Um, so going straight into the data collection, at the last conference um, I spoke to you about the measures we've taken since um, the start of the pandemic to improve and uh, maintain our response rates. And so whilst I won't go into all that detail again, uh, I just wanted to give you a bit of a more of an up-to-date view on, on how this picture has evolved since then. Um, so on this slide here, you can see the response rates um, since 2019 with the gray line at the top representing 2019. And the green line for 2020 shows obviously where responses dropped to. Um, so obviously halved almost in uh, March 2020, the onset of the pandemic, and the blue blue line um, represents 2021, and you can see there the increase in April when we introduced Knock to Nudge, where we basically um, brought our field interviewers out again and uh, asked them to sort of knock on doors and try to encourage um, the public to participate 
again, not doing face-to-face -face interviews uh, at that point, but uh, basically trying to encourage them to participate in telephone interviews. And that bedded in quite well, as you can see, uh, but it started to decrease again. And uh, you can see that in the, in the red line for 2022, so last year, um, it, it was difficult to maintain the level of response as obviously um, across all our surveys, we started to roll out or test face-to-face -face interviews um, in, in one way or another. And um, it, it was difficult to maintain that level with, with all the different competing parties and, and um, uh, field strategies. Um, <clears throat> so at, at the last conference, I spoke about um, the measures we had taken um, to improve uh, response rate. One of the things we did was um, we tried to increase our achieved samples, uh, so our issued sample size um, to address the drop in response. So here again, the gray line representing 2019 achieved sample sizes and the green line, um, what it looked like when the pandemic started. So you can see the decrease in April straight away. Um, uh, as response rates halved. Um, we basically doubled our sample size in July that year, and you can see the, the achieved sample um, going up straight away, which was fantastic. Um, and we thereafter tweaked the sample size ever so slightly uh, quarter on quarter to, to see, that, you know, to make sure we sort of keep, keep close to what we achieved uh, pre-pandemic. But as you can see, obviously, the red line representing last year, um, it was difficult to maintain that level with everything else that was going on. Um, and so just wanted to mention, obviously, that whilst we have rolled out face to face on uh, some of our other surveys in one way or another, some promoting it as a sort of um, a default option, others trialing it to start with. So. We, we sort of had to feel our way through that and see what, what works um, once so we were allowed to do that again. On the LFS, we decided to not fully roll out face-to-face -face interviews. So we um, decided to um, just offer it basically where it is necessary for, inclusive, for inclusivity and where we would otherwise lose the interview. But we largely wanted to keep the mode constant with uh, mainly telephone interviews, as we are obviously dual running this survey now with the transformed LFS and we're trying to compare estimates and by changing things constantly, it would make that a lot more difficult. So trying to demonstrate this with this slide here, where you can see that uh, whilst the um, uh, proportion of face-to-face -face interviews has slightly increased towards the second half of last year, where we relaxed this rule a little bit. The vast majority of our Wave 1 interviews is still done over the phone, and uh, we continue this strategy until we uh, transition to the transformed LFS. Um, so what is impacting our response? So there's a lot of external factors like expectations of respondents having changed since the, pan since the pandemic, more people actually asking you know, for online completion. And this is what we're trying to cater for with the transformed LFS. Um, then expectations of interviews to some extent have also changed since the pandemic. Um, so it's somewhat more challenging um, to, to retain them or to also to recruit new interviewers. Uh, there's other uh, external factors that, that are outside our control, like just recently the Royal Mail strike um, end of last year, um, which meant that advanced letters landed later and meant that it was much more difficult, obviously, then to engage the, the public in participating within that short window of, of data collection. That we have and um, obviously capacities are stretched. The market for interviewer recruits has changed since the pandemic. Um, the logistics for interviews is more complex because of different approaches uh, for returning to face-to-face -face interviewing and we have competing priorities also now with, um, so James will mention that later about uh, the transformed labour force so we're also introducing a, or has, has introduced a field mode so 
you know, we, we obviously have to carefully manage the, the various data collection priorities that we've got. And um, yeah, that's that's definitely, you know, um, showing an effect. Um, so what to expect going forward? So something that I just wanted to make users aware of that is when you are using APS data sets um, for lower level analysis, then you'll probably find that the sample overall has been decreasing because whilst we adjusted and increased the main sample uh, since the pandemic to address the drop in response rates, the boost sample has not changed and therefore suffered more from the drop in response. Um, the ONS is currently re reviewing its priorities for face-to-face -face data collection and to see how we can uh, manage our field force also more efficiently and effectively. Um, and we obviously also put measures in place to improve our recruitment and onboarding of interviewers and, and training them, you know, to um, make sure we, we use our, our resource more, more effectively and, and, and um, on, on our field data collection priorities. <clears throat> Then moving on to reweighting. So again, I, there's there's a lot of uh, on the methodology side. I think that we covered in the in last year's uh, conference. So I'll, I don't want to go into all that detail again, but I can provide some links in the chat later to um, articles we published in that space. Um, so just sort of to summarise, I guess where we are with the reweighting prior to the pandemic. Um, our data was reweighted every two years using the latest uh, population projections. Um, obviously, since the pandemic, the mode change from face to face to telephone interviews for wave one has introduced some some bias to the data. We've got we found that we had more owner occupiers, for example, than renters and that participated. Uh, the split between UK born and non UK UK born uh, population. Um, it looked odd, so we had to tweak our waiting process um, to account for that. Um, so we have since 2020 um, reweighted annually, adjusting the calibration um, with tenure in 2020. So that was our first reweighting exercise. And then in 2021 and 2022, uh, we used population growth rates that were based on the um, RTI data, so the income tax data from the HMRC, which has its limitations, but that was basically the best <clears throat> available data for us to adjust our population growth rates. And uh, the latest round of reweighting is uh, almost complete. So we started that uh, probably second half of last year. Uh, we just released the um, uh, five, uh, five quarter longitudinal data sets again with the revised weights um, in mid January. And um, in mid March, we're going to release the reweighted APS wave one weight as well. And so that reweighting exercise is then completed. Um, what's going to happen going forward is that. Um, so we are considering obviously what we're doing next. There's new RTI data expected to be released <clears throat> in spring. Um, and we're having discussions about potential further RTI based reweighting exercise that might happen post transition to the uh, transformed LFS. Um, we're also considering obviously uh, whether and when we would do um, a census-based reweighting exercise once population projections for England, Wales and Scotland are available, but this is not expected before 2024. So somewhat after the uh, planned transition to the transformed LFS, which means that any further reweighting plans really need to be considered alongside the transformed LFS and its new um, estimation methodology. So we can't look at it in isolation for the current LFS. We need to look at that longer term picture really from a from a user perspective as well. Um, so that's the news on the rating. And then I wanted to draw your attention to an issue, as I said earlier, that we identified in the collection of our occupational uh, data. We published two announcements in July and August last year um, to make users aware that we had identified an error uh, with the collection of occupational data. 
not just uh, affecting the LFS, it's across our social surveys. Um, and at that point, we knew what the problem was, but obviously didn't know quite um, enough about the extent of it or the impact. So we did a lot more work on that. And then we published a paper in uh, uh, September last year, which you've got a link for in the slides, well, which will be sent around after, um, or will be published on the uh, UKDS uh, website, I believe. And um, in that article, we basically presented the approaches that we took to understand the impact uh, and also the level of impact and the timeline um, we estimate that it takes us to fix this problem. Um, <clears throat> so just a sort of a brief overview of the work we did to assess the impact. So we reviewed the uh, SOC coding index um, that interviewers use basically to code occupational data as part of the interview. Um, we compared a sort of time series of data at a, a very low level um, to understand what happened with the switch from 2010 to 2020 SOC uh, codes. Um, we compared uh, the data also, or the LFS data also with the census, although there is a different coding methodology because census uses an automated uh, coding approach, whereas on the LFS it's interview-led coding. And uh, we had then sort of an initial exercise done of using uh, automated as well as, well as clerical recoding, try to assess the outcome of that as well. And then we basically published this paper in um, September, where we included a list of all the 412 four-digit unit groups and the estimated uh, impact for this group. So this table here is a summary of the impact, showing that about half of the codes are expected to be impacted at a high level by this error. And then we mentioned the paper um, also about a timeline of when we expect, the, so sorry, before I go to that. Um, so this is the impact at a four digit level and at one digit level, the estimated net change um, is expected to be fairly small. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the, the group that we would estimate to be impacted at the largest would be group two, uh, which is the professional occupations. Uh, for around 0.3 percentage point difference. Um, so the work, the recoding of SOC codes since, so for SOC codes from January 2021 onwards is well underway. And uh, we estimated that the work would take us about um, six months. Um, and, and we are still on, on track with that. Obviously, once all the SOC codes have been recoded, then all the relevant derived variables will have to be revised and um, micro data sets will be um, re-released -re as well as um, the aggregated tables that we published on our website will also be corrected accordingly. Um, so just to be mindful of, um, to use ca apply caution when using the SOC uh, occupational data from January 2021 onwards at the moment, in particular, if you're planning to use um, SOC codes that um, we highlighted as um, having a high impact or being highly impacted by this SOC coding error. Um, and with that, I'm on to my uh, last topic and that is the uh, transition to the transformed LFS. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to go into detail about the transformed LFS, so I leave that to James, who will tell you a lot more about that in a minute. But when we transition to the uh, new LFS, the aim is to decommission the current LFS APS, and that is all waves at once, with the end of June this year. However, before it comes to that, we expect um, a decision to be made by the office, um, and that is um, expected by March, April time this year. Once we get to that point of decommissioning, we obviously then inform all our respondents that are still part of the panel that they won't be contacted for any further waves. So it's not that they would then move to the transformed LFS, that's a separate sample. And from a user perspective, 
I thought it would be useful for you to be aware that um, obviously we will process and produce all relevant data sets covering the periods up until April to June 2023. But that will mean that certain data sets cannot be produced as we're not doing a full year in 2023. So there won't be an APS household data set January to December 2023, for example, or an APS two year longitudinal data set for 2022 to 2023 or an APS three-year pooled data set, including 2023. Um, just so of um, high level timeline in terms of what this year would look like now, or will look like now from our perspective. So obviously all the um, you know, data collection and, and outputs production goes ahead as normal until mid this year, uh, depending the decision in March, April. We're obviously supporting the transformation and preparing for the transition alongside that. Uh, and then we'll transition to using the transformed LFS in all our processes and outputs production. Until mid this year, we should have the SOC revision uh, concluded. And obviously the reweighting, as I mentioned earlier, should conclude much earlier. We hope to have this all done by mid of March, although we're obviously thinking about potentially a further reweighting exercise on then historical LFS data potentially later this year. <clears throat> so to prepare for the transition, users are advised to uh, read up on the already published user guides, which we um, published on our website in November last year, which includes sort of a high level background user guide, variable mapping uh, document and a dummy data set. Um, James will say a little bit more about that later. We obviously also uh, publish more in the user guide space over the course of um, the next few months around derived variables and also more about the data sets, etc. And there are also plans for you know blog blogs and um, articles around comparing the estimates from the two sources over the course of the transition. And uh, that that brings me to the end of my presentation. So I hope I didn't take too long. So perhaps we have a few minutes for questions before we can hand over to James. Uh, I am now uh, going to uh, give the floor to uh james harris so uh james harris uh he's uh, actually if i understand properly uh leading the team uh behind the uh transform labor force survey so he has been working for a few years is uh, in population statistics uh on estimates and projections at dns before uh moving on to uh, to the transformed LFS and he's indeed going to uh, update us about uh, the work being done and what to expect with the transformed LFS so James I'm giving you the uh, the floor now fantastic thank you hopefully everybody can me uh, good to see you all um, I'm holding transformation. I'm, I'm leading kind of the transition from the current survey to the new survey. Other uh, people are actually creating the stuff. Uh, James, uh, we the bandwidth doesn't seem to be very good, so maybe you could switch off your video uh, to okay. make. Okay. So, um, uh, so it's it's good to see everybody here, and it's good to have uh, direct interaction with all the people who are going to be impacted by what we're doing here. So the uh, transformed LFS and what it means for all of you and uh, essentially how things have progressed over the last year and, and over the year ahead as well. Uh, so uh, as was uh, mentioned uh, a little earlier, uh, we're celebrating 50 years of the LFS. In, this is the 50th year since we started collecting these statistics, which cover the labor market and demographics and all sorts of factors and features about people's everyday lives. And uh, the, the survey is continuing to evolve through this transformation. So bringing some of the old kind of paper, paper approach and things down on, on uh, in actual hard paperwork. And now moving towards the online first collection processes supported by telephone and, and other uh, features behind it as well. So at, bringing us actually into the digital age and it's in our 50th year that we're going through this. So a, a very proud time for all of us. So. The last time I was here, this was the timeline for the transformation. So uh, we were looking at ahead at the time to February and April 2022. 
And of course, now things have moved on a little. So if I click to the next slide, so this is where we are currently. Uh, you may be able to see that one or two things have moved a little bit to the right, but fundamentally the timeline is essentially still the same. So starting in February last year, we did successfully uh, introduce telephone mode into the survey. And following telephone mode in, in November, we also added the final mode, the face-to-face -face mode, as it were. And, but at the moment, that's only knocking to nudge. So that is all three modes of the survey, live, active, in, in collection right now. Uh, and in, in between those times, we also had an increase in the sample size and the addition of more content. So in theory, all the labor market content has been included since September last year. So huge amounts of work and developments going on over the course of the last year, leading us to where we are now. Uh, during that time, we have also uh, been obviously running the dual run. So both surveys have been active at the same time. Uh, and. Uh, sharing and comparing the differences between the two sets of results and the uh, responses that we've been getting to them. And over that time, we've also had uh, a user engagement exercise in March to June last year and some more targeted business change engagements with departments, divisions and people since then about the impact and results this uh, uh, change in this survey is likely to have upon them and heading towards what we're going to be doing over the coming year. But I'll come on to that in a second. So what we're looking at uh, in the months ahead of us, and I stress the word months, it's not years anymore, heading towards uh, around about March, April time, as Martina mentioned, that the transformed LFS will hopefully meet the quality criteria to become the primary source for labor market statistics, assuming that that is met and that those decisions are made, heading towards then a little bit of further content being added to the transformed survey and the decommissioning of the existing survey. So at the end of June, we would theoretically decommission the current survey and then the new survey is the de facto source of data from that point onwards. Leading towards the kind of pink section, which is from that point onwards, it is all the TLFS, it's all the new survey source from that point. It's the first publication of data using that new source being in September. And then from that point onwards, all the other surveys and sources and publications eventually coming on board with the new survey as the data starts rolling out on a regular basis. So what we've been uh, developing, so as I say, we've increased the sample size and they are now at the target levels, or at least for the time being. Uh, and we've included all the key labor market content, but there's an awful lot of further development of additional content. So there are other questions, response categories, tweaks and changes, looking at topics like sexual orientation and gender identity, trying to squeeze in as many of these key fundamental issues that people are interested in that we want to know about the, the population and the workforce specifically. So an awful lot of that content will hopefully be added in before decommission in June. We're working through the testing of that right now. So the questions have been developed, but we're working through the actual testing and implementation of them as I speak. Um, so we've now, as I say, added the final mode of data collection. That's the quote unquote field mode, although it is only not to nudge at the moment. We will eventually move to actual face to face interviews if it's necessary in future, but that's unlikely to happen this particular year. Uh, and we're monitoring and adjusting based upon the current performance. So looking at the response rates that we're getting, looking at the results, looking at the way people are answering the new questions in the new fashion, making sure that people are understanding the questions, that we're getting a sufficient uh, response all across the country in the different categories of people in the different strata and breakdowns. And uh, in similar fashion, looking at the results of the, the survey. So whether or not it's producing similar labor market outcomes to what we would expect or what the current LFS produces, or ideally both. Uh, so investigating what the results actually look like. Still very early days, we're just about getting enough data with enough of the survey design implemented and everything through. But the investigation has started internally and over the course of the next few months, we'll then spread that out to other surveys, uh, I'm sorry, other sources, other breakdowns, other publications, making sure that it, there is a consistent story with the, the current and the transformed survey and hopefully that the bias or indeed the bias is reduced or the accuracy is increased as a result of this new survey and then some further methodological development has been happening not much has been published about that yet but we're hoping in the next couple of months that we'll be able to share a bit more information a bit more detail about what methodological changes and, and uh, improvements have been made to the survey and indeed perhaps some of the changes we're expecting over the next 12 to 18 months if more work is needed beyond just that June decommissioning date. So an awful lot has been happening, very grateful to all the people involved, various different divisions of ONS, there's an awful lot of people involved in delivering this. So where we are with the response rate at the moment, 
uh, focusing on wave one only. There's not enough of the TLFS to do much more, but looking at wave one, uh, all the modes combined, so it's changed over time. We had online first and then telephone and then um, face to face, but wherever possible, whichever modes existed at the time. You can see that, uh, as Martina mentioned earlier, the current LFS, the lighter blue bars, have slowly been dropping over time, which is somewhat unfortunate, but the uh, priority is to get the TLFS online and working, and that has been very slowly increasing over time. Uh, the aggregated response is about 41% at the latest count. For the wave one here, it reports is around about 44%, but on the whole, with everything added together, it's around about 41% at the moment. So a, a good response and where it should be, and importantly, it is improving, especially with the results of the knocking to nudge. So if I move on to that, looking at the response rates by the indices of multiple deprivation, so the most deprived households on the left-hand side and the uh, least deprived households on the right hand side you can see the the um, difference in between them so the most deprived households are far less likely to respond to the survey the least deprived households are the much more likely to respond to the survey and as a result of introducing the the field mode so knocking people's houses encouraging them to respond to the survey uh, reaching out to especially the the more deprived areas and and certain demographics of people that has now improved the, the differential. So the least deprived has improved a little bit and some of those categories, uh, eight, nine and 10 have improved a little bit, but more importantly, the lower end, the, the most deprived households have improved much more significantly, bringing it, um, bringing it much more in line, a, a more uh, common approach all across the country. So hopefully uh, um, improved uh, levels of bias all across the board. Of course, still very much a work in progress, and I'll, I'll describe more about uh, an improvement that's happening there in a moment. Uh, so Martina mentioned the, the TLFS user guidance, so I'll, I'll just briefly explain uh, what's in there and what's been going on. So we published the first version of user guidance material to provide everybody with information about the, the transformed survey design, the methodology and the content, the situation as at October 2022. So this was published on the 14th of November. That was the current state of play as is at the moment. And it included three items. Uh, I'll, I'll skip that and move straight to the first one here. So on the right hand side, that was an introductory page to our current um, volume one, but that's now changed very significantly. That's the current uh, version of our, our background user guide for the TLFS. So this contains all the key background and methodological information about the survey design and how to use it, or at least the skeleton thereof. We'll be adding much more information to it over the coming few months as more gets developed and, and written and improved and uh, we're able to release more information. Uh, so uh, this is a much simplified version of the former LFS documentation. So trying to focus on exactly what it is you need to know, the key details, the key aspects, uh, you know, we do have a 50 year history, but there's an awful lot of bloat. You don't need to know necessarily what happened in the 1990s. You have all the historic information in, in other documents if you need them. This is focusing on the transformed survey and what the, the current and future state is going to look like, hopefully making it much easier for you to digest and understand and a lot shorter to actually get through as well. Um, but still work going on on this this collection of information as i say around about april may time hopefully an updated version of this will be coming out with more information especially in terms of the content speaking of content we also put out a, a dummy data set so this is what this the current data set looks like so you can see the design the shape the variable definitions what you could call the architecture of the file what you can expect the microdata to look like. So you can see the, the names of the current variables, the, the variable names, the uh, type of variable, or in some cases, the uh, an example response for that variable. So for example, the case ID is listed as a numeric variable, seven characters long, whereas the, the month of the survey, survey month, is listed as number three, because that was an actual number, number three. It's a mixture of those things so you can see what the data looks like and start preparing thinking how, how the names of the variables may have changed and how that might affect you, your systems, your analysis. At the moment, it doesn't contain any actual data. It's just that one example response so that you're able to test with your systems. But over the next few months, we'll be sharing the actual data set. So indicative results in, in summarized form and uh, micro data to actually work with. So watch this space. We're not quite there yet, but we will be there in, in the coming few weeks and months. 
Uh, also, the third item was the mapping file, so an Excel file, the transformed TLFS to LFS mapping document, it was called, which contains all the regular variables contained in the design as at October. So uh, it doesn't contain the derived variables, so things like uh, ILODEFR, I-L-O-D-E-F-R, is not in there just yet. This is the uh, regular variables, so to speak where it's just a question on the survey that maps straight through to the data sets. Um, but it gives you an idea of what the current variable is and was called and, and was asking, and then the new variable, what it is and, and is asking, and the response categories thereof. So I picked out a particular example here of uh, whether or not people are looking for work. So what was the main reason uh, you did not look for work in this particular period? And you can see the response values of the current survey on the right-hand side the response values of the new survey on the left hand side largely the same things like retirement and studying are still there maybe in a different place but they are still valid response categories but we've added a, a couple of extra bits and pieces in there for example looking at uh, child care and, and caring responsibilities so new key variables that people were interested in valid response categories that uh, should give you a little bit more information than you've previously had so there will be changes like this over the place, uh, some very minor that you probably wouldn't even notice, some a little bit more major. And you can see the, the blue bar in the middle gives you an idea of what whether it matches, whether it's exactly the same, because a lot of variables like age will largely not change, or some of them like this, where there has been a change, trying to describe what that change looks like. And you can see that in the, the little blue bar in the middle of this document. So hopefully uh, a good amount of information in there, but again, we'll be updating these as we go through. And then touching a little bit on the ongoing development. So one particular thing that we're working on right now is uh, adapting the survey design. So very grateful to my colleague, uh, Maria Tortoriello for a bit of the information here. The uh, current data collection strategy, is the same fundamentally for all addresses. We're sampling using a systematic random sample from a particular file. And then for five quarters, we go out to each address with an invitation to take part in the survey. And if they haven't yet responded, we'll encourage them either by telephone or by knocking the front door and saying, please respond to the survey. You could do so by telephone or by other means. And we carry that out through 13 geographically representative cohorts run on a weekly basis. So uh, it's geographically representative largely in terms of region, but obviously we do try and make adjustments at the local level as well. So the response rate indicates what proportion of people are invited to take part. And there's unfortunately an unequal distribution of responses, what's called the differential non-response bias. So, uh, for example, during the pandemic and, and uh, in, in the early stages, when it was online collection only. There was a bias more towards the white male home owned men aged around 45. So that they were more likely to be responding to the survey than other demographics. But of course, we uh, for the purposes of accuracy, for the purposes of reducing bias, uh, making sure that we have uh, good levels of confidence for your estimates and analysis, um, trying to make sure that we capture all the other categories that we possibly can and trying to improve our survey design to reach out to all the other demographics of people and improve the response rates all across the board. The statistical processing, the methodological processes can enable weighting of the sample to account for some of this bias, but fundamental confidence in the estimates only improves if we improve the source data itself, if we go out and ask the people themselves and get their actual responses. So we have three key quality targets for the survey. I won't delve into detail, but reducing the bias, reducing the attrition and improving the response rate, generally speaking. So making sure we capture everybody all across the country, making sure they stay in the survey for as many waves as possible and trying to get as many people as possible to actually respond to the survey. So fundamentally trying to improve the quality of this survey. How are we adapting the survey to meet those targets? That's the key question I'm touching on here. Well, implementing what's called the adaptive survey design. So dividing the full sample into smaller groups and similar characteristics, what's called segmentation. One size does not fit all. So trying to apply different approaches to all these different categories of people and adapting the survey design for all those different groups. So some of them, it may be more suitable by telephone, some online, some face to face. It may mean that they need special printed materials for them or they're more likely to respond if you contact them in the morning or evening or at night or whenever it might be. So different ways of approaching these people. It may be that a different incentive would appeal to them more. So some of them will respond to a financial voucher, some may be a tote bag, some of them may prefer printed materials like a notebook and pen 
trying different incentive approaches to make sure that uh, we're capturing all the right people as best we can. And of course, changing the way we follow up with people. So it may be that they're, they're not responding to the telephone, they're more likely to respond online or they're more likely to respond with a knock on the door. It may be that uh, certain ge geographies are responding in a different way, that you're more likely to get a response by knocking on the door in Cumbria than you are in London, for example. Who knows? Looking at all the different aspects of how people are responding, why they're responding, or indeed not responding, and adapting our design to, to meet those uh, changing needs. So the objective here, of course, is to uh, improve the, the survey outcomes. But it is working within certain budgetary constraints. Obviously, I would say an incentive of £50 is far more likely to succeed than an incentive of £5. But there are certain limitations on what we can do. But working within those bounds, doing what we can to improve the responses. Uh, so I've listed here four key features to the uh, adapt uh, adaptivity of this design. So dividing the, the sample into eight different strata. So split by age, around about the age of 45. So lower ages and higher ages, segmenting by urban versus rural areas, and segmenting by the indices of multiple deprivation, so the more deprived versus the less deprived peoples, and you end up with eight different strata, and that was built using a logistic regression model using existing information that we already have, so figuring out who is, and is, less, who is more or less likely to respond to the survey using what we already know and adapting accordingly. We've already talked about utilizing knock and nudge, but also utilizing new indicators, so representativity indicators, looking at the quality and cost and the uh, contrast between different respondents and non-respondents, so uh, building better uh, monitoring processes behind it. And of course, a little bit of trial and error thrown in here as well, so testing what works and what doesn't work and building on, on what we're testing as we go through. So if something works, we then build upon that and take the next step and test uh, new things built upon that. So an awful lot of this improvement over time and of course, this is the transformed survey. So it's live, but it's still, you know, it's in the field. It's still happening. It's still being collected every week, month, uh, quarter, year. It, this will be developing over the course of time. Um, so development's still underway, in particular for the adaptive design. So this started rolling out as of November. So when the, the knock and nudge processes became live, uh, and when we were undertaking uh, continuous evaluation uh, of what's actually going on, how successful it is, we're monitoring the effectiveness of the design with the management information dashboard, which is almost collected in real time. I know it's not minute by minute, but hour by hour, I would argue it, it updates and uh, it, it's uh, showing which parts of the country and which types of people are, are responding and we're able to adjust accordingly. So sending out knock to nudge processes to different areas uh, and adapting where the field force is actually targeting. And we're continuing to explore auxiliary data sources to figure out what how, uh, what will work to encourage respondents to actually reply. But that was very much on the adaptive design. There's an awful lot more going on over the coming month. So as I said already, continuing and conducting analysis and investigation of what we've collected. And if we are finding problems, issues and errors, then making some tweaks and adjustments to fix any problems. That's not just in the data itself. So the survey design or the content or the questionnaire, but also operational issues where maybe the telephone operators or the interviewers have identified some issue or problem. So making sure that we're working through this, even things like the, the Royal Mail strikes that Martina mentioned, having to factor in how best to respond to those kinds of problems. Uh, monitoring and making adjustments to the quality, still an awful lot of work going on with the methodological development. Things like the estimation approach, the wave structures, the exact content that's being uh, added in there, the approach to waiting and everything else, all of those things are still under review and still being developed. We should do more developments over the next two, three months. Uh, and of course, further delivery of questions. So still going out to uh, um, uh, interested parties, making sure that we have captured the things that they're interested in, their requirements of what questions should be in the survey, what content they'd like to see, what policies and, and uh, interventions we're trying to work with. So as I say, celebrating here, the 50 years of the LFS, you should expect a bunch of publications and webinars over the next few months covering all the various aspects of the design, the indicative results and updates on progress and plans throughout 2023. So a link there to one of our uh, progress updates, uh, which we're now publishing on a quarterly basis. 
Uh, we've, we're further developing the user guidance and the quality uh, uh, and additional delivery of content as well. So an awful lot of uh, activity going on. And of course, we're trying to continue the legacy that Richard mentioned, uh, a vital source of survey data for all of your needs. And we're trying to meet it in the best way we possibly can, trying to continue this legacy, not just for the current 50 years, but for the next 50 years as well. And uh, if you need more information, obviously you can contact me or Martina, but you can also get in touch through the Labour Market Transformation Inbox uh, link there. Um, if you have problems, issues, questions, you want more information about the methodology, you want to be invited to any webinars or seminars, or maybe you've been dropped off a newsletter list or whatever it is, please get in touch and, and we'll be happy to engage and, and support you through this transitional period. And that brings me to the end, Beer. Uh, almost on time, close enough, hopefully enough for a couple of Q&A.